we're delighted to have uh, Father John Baldwin uh, illuminating for us this concept of Eucharist as medicine, which is something that has come up um, from Pope Francis frequently uh, over the past uh, bit of time. Uh, Father Baldwin is a priest of the Northeast Province of the Society of Jesus. He's a professor of historical and liturgical theology at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Um, he's a graduate of the College of the Holy Cross, as well as Western uh, Jesuit School of Theology, and he holds his PhD from, uh, from Yale University. His teaching and research uh, includes the history of liturgy, uh, theology of liturgy, sacramental theology, and the history of Christian doctrine. Uh, prior to coming to Boston in 1999 to teach at, at Weston, um, uh, and then uh, later into the School of Theology and Ministry, Father Baldwin taught at Fordham University, at the Jesuit School of Theology at Berkeley. Uh, in addition, he's also served as visiting professor at the University of Notre Dame, um, at St. John Vianney National Seminary in Pretoria, South Africa, and he held the Loyola Chair at Fordham in 2013-14. Um, Father Baldwin generously contributes to the pastoral needs of the church. Um, he served uh, on the U.S. Uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops Advisory Committee on Liturgy, as well as the uh, Advisory uh, International Commission on uh, English in the Liturgy, or, or ISIL. Um, he's past president of the International Ecumenical uh, Society, Societas Liturgia and the International Jungmann Society for, Je for Jesuits uh, and, the, and the Liturgy and the North American Academy on Liturgy. On weekends, he uh, presides at Mass at Sacred Heart and St. Bridget's Parishes in Lexington. His pastoral concern is very evident uh, in his writing. Um, he has published widely on liturgy with a long list of journal articles and chapters and books as well as popular publications such as American Commonweal. He's also been guest editor of two issues of our C21 resources out from the church in the 21st century, um, which is a free publication for Boston College, the, um, the Eucharist at the, at the Center of Catholic Life, and um, Catholics, a Sacramental People. And we have copies of these in the back if you'd like to grab one if you don't have one already. It has some great articles in it. And, uh, and if you aren't familiar with this publication, you might want to grab one and then go online. You can register to get free copies. Uh, they come out once a semester. And um, have been uh, consistently uh, solid articles on a variety of, of important topics. Um, Father uh, Baldwin also has a series of uh, 48 um, video um, lectures on the Mass and liturgical seasons published by Now You Know Media. He's the editor or co-editor of uh, four books and the author of five, including Bread of Life, Cup of Salvation, Understanding the Mass in 203, Reforming the Liturgy, A Response to the Critics in 08, and Catholic Sacraments, A Rich Source of Blessing in 2015. Um, all of these titles ought to be available from the bookstore, but they are not here yet. So hope they didn't get rained out, but um, they should be, should be here before the, before the program is over. When he was awarded the uh, first place in liturgy by the Catholic Press Association in, two, uh, in 2009, the liturgical press wrote, Perhaps no liturgical scholar of our time is better able than John Baldwin to write with clarity and accuracy about the meaning of the church's liturgy and the history of its development in the last half century. So we really are honored to have him with us. Uh, so please join me in welcoming my, my good colleague and scholar and priest, Father John Baldwin. Thank you, thank you, Jane, and good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a deli delight to be with you this evening uh, to share with you some thoughts about the Eucharist medicine of immortality, um, especially as it relates, as we said, the subtitle uh, to uh, Pope Francis and his idea of uh, the church as a field hospital. So uh, without further ado, uh, here's our uh, man who came up with the phrase Eucharist as Medicine of Immortality, a second century bishop uh, named uh, Ignatius of Antioch. And here's the text in which he 
talks about the medicine of immortality. He says, especially if the Lord make known to me that you come together in common through grace, individually in one faith, he's big on unity, and in Jesus Christ, who is the seed of David according to the flesh, being both the son of man and the son of God, so that you obey the bishop and the presbytery with an undivided mind. Again, unity. Breaking one and the same bread, which is the medicine of immortality and the antidote to prevent us from dying, but which causes that we should live forever in Jesus Christ. Now, what are we talking about when we call the Eucharist the medicine of immortality? Are we talking about some kind of pill? I mean, that's the, the image that's conjured up for us, isn't it, when we say medicine, right? Medicine, uh, many of us here take multiple <laughs> medicines, I'm sure, uh, all the time. Uh, that's, so that's a normal idea. So what does this mean, uh, a medicine of immortality? The thesis of this presentation is going to be the following. The Eucharist incorporates us into the living body of Christ and forms us, makes us into a Eucharistic people, giving us the capacity to live the Christian virtues and respond in faith to the gift of God in Christ. That is going to be what I try to show as the medicine of immortality, what gives us real immortal life. By that token, I continue, uh, we participate in the great vocation of all Christians. This is the great vocation of every Christian is to participate in Christ's own priesthood, his self-sacrifice and offering of the world back to the Father. So I understand Christ's priesthood and ours. The fundamental priesthood is that of Christ to which we are joined. People like me who happen to be ordained serve the common priesthood that we all uh, participate in and all share. So let me ask a question. So uh, let me ask a question. This is a question that, that uh, constantly is on my mind. Huh? Uh, especially in the pastoral work that I do that Jane mentioned. Does our worship really have anything to do with how we actually live our lives? It seems to me that in some sense the growing edge of a liturgy has been for the last 50 years, and uh, we haven't yet gotten too far with it, is to help make people make that connection between what we celebrate in the four walls of a church and how we actually live our lives. And that's going to be the burden of the rest of this presentation. I'm going to talk about a tripod. I've, st I've stolen this, uh, this uh, notion from a theologian named Louis-Marie Chauvet. You're going to get a picture of him in a moment. He talks about the tripod of scripture, sacrament, and ethics to form a balanced Christian life. There's, your, there's a good picture of a tripod. Um, and um, you know a tripod is only as good as the, as the equal length of its legs, right? It, Something's not going to stand on it unless the legs are equal. So there has to be a balance here. Huh? Uh, I was uh, lecturing in uh, South Africa and Swaziland for uh, uh, most of, all of July, most of August this past, uh, our summer, not theirs. Uh, and uh, people reminded me of the fact that uh, they had their own tripod, which is, a, which is a traditional African cooking pot, the same principle. Uh, here's a picture of uh, uh, Father Chauvet, who's a very important French theologian, and of his easier book, this is only 200 pages, uh, the sacraments, symbol and sacrament is 555 pages, and so uh, only my very advanced students have to read that. Um, but the sacraments is a good 200 page book and uh, is uh, well worth the read. So scripture, sacrament, and ethics. Scripture, sacrament, and ethics. I'm going to try to uh, illustrate that by a couple of scripture stories. Notice that I uh, put here on the first slide about the Eucharist, uh, not a picture of the Last Supper in terms of the institution of the Eucharist by our Lord, but a picture of the Lord's service at the Last Supper. Unless we can make the connection, which is a connection the church makes for us on Holy Thursday, unless we can make the connection between the Eucharist that we celebrate week by week and this humble service of one another, in the washing of the feet that's illustrated so beautifully 
in John chapter 13, I don't think we get what the Eucharist is about. So let me use as an illustration, I'm going to take us through two important scripture passages. The first is Luke 24 and the story of Emmaus. There you see Jesus with the uh, two, sorry, with the d two disciples he meets on the road. Huh? I'll give you the, t I'm going to go through the text. Uh, whoops. Now on that same day, this is this Easter Sunday evening, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. This is like that great scene in John 20, Mary Magdalene doesn't, thinks he's a gardener, where Peter and the rest of them in John 21 thinks he's a breakfast cook. Um, they don't recognize him. And he said to them, what are you discussing with each other as you walk along? They stood still looking sad, as well they might be. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have taken place there in these days? He asked them, what things? They replied, the things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and crucified him. And here comes the next phrase, which is one of the saddest phrases in both Testaments, the old and the new. But we had hoped. We had hoped. Or another translation, we were hoping that he was the one to redeem Israel. Our hopes, they are sad, because their hopes have been dashed, right? This, the, the person they put their hopes in, that, that, that they trusted, that they were hoping to be the Messiah, to, to, to rescue Israel from the oppression that they were uh, experiencing under the Romans, uh, he died the death of a disgraced criminal outside of the walls of Jerusalem. There he is talking to them. Then he said to them, oh, fellow, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with the Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them the things about himself in all the scriptures. We're going to come back to that. He interpreted to them all the things about himself in the scriptures. Here's a couple of nice pictures of uh, plenty. I never knew what I, I don't know what I ever, I ever did before I discovered Google Images. But uh, here's a Titian, one of my favorite painters. Here's a good African one. Uh, here's Caravaggio's Milan version of the uh, Supper at Emmaus. I'm going to come to the other good one, the be better one, I think that Jane showed you on the cover of our, our magazine uh, in a moment. So, next step. As they came near the village to which they were going, he walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us because it is almost evening, evening and the day is now nearly over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed, and broke it and gave it to them. Those words should be familiar to us, right? They're the same four verbs that you'll see in the miraculous feeding stories, right? feeding of the 5,000, for example, in, in Mark chapter 6, and the same four verbs that you'll see in St. Paul when he's uh, telling the Corinthians about the Eucharist. That's going to be the other passage I talk about. And, uh, of course, in the Last Supper narratives in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Then, and he vanished from their sight. This is that moment so gorgeously captured by Caravaggio, it seems to me, especially the expression on the faces, the face of the guy on the right in particular. Huh? He gets it. Finally, he gets it, right? Uh, the funny thing is that the guy who's, uh, who's the waiter, right, he doesn't seem to get it, right? He's looking on saying, what's up? What's up, dude, uh, as they say? Um, he doesn't know what's, what's happening. Um, well, he's not a person who's been schooled in the faith. He has not had the Lord explain the scriptures to him, uh, as, uh, as the others said, said. 
uh, had. They said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he was talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour, they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, the Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon, Peter. Then they told what had happened to them on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Here are those three factors of scripture, sacrament, and ethics. Scripture, the Lord himself explaining, opening up, breaking open the scriptures about himself to them on the road. This is not sufficient, it seems. This is not sufficient. The sacramental act, that physical act, that embodied act is necessary for them to come to the realization, for the penny to, to drop, for the ice to break. The sacramental act is necessary for them to recognize, to understand the nature of the scriptures. This, I think, is at the heart of the Roman Catholic vision of things, right? that connection between sacrament and scripture. And, but that's not enough. So there's a third leg to the tripod. Huh? The third leg is ethics. Ethics, doing something. Do they sit there and say to the waiter, what is on the dessert menu, right? <laughs> Do you have creme brulee, apple pie, whatever you want to, okay. Um, or to, would we have had to offer the, order the souffle earlier or something like that? Okay. No, they don't. They go immediately, right? They immediately are on a mission and they go back to Jerusalem uh, to live out what they have just experienced. That is the tripod. Chauvet uh, himself uh, has a, uh, I just copied this from his book, has a beautiful way of uh, illustrating this uh, when he talks about Christ as the primary sacrament of God for us, right? representation, realization of God for us, the church as the representation of Christ, and within the church, uh, especially you've got the S which with the scriptures, right? And the sacrament, he has not got enough room there to, to spell out sacrament, and ethics. These all constituting faith are interrelated. They all relate to one another. But he makes the point that scripture is the point that has to be passed, I'm sorry, uh, the sacrament is the point that has to be passed through. And it seems to me that is the Catholic thing. Right? Uh, now, the church here is represented, and I love this, the church is represented by a dotted line. This is extremely important for him and I think for us. Why a dotted line? Especially in this day and age, and this is one of the things that the uh, that Pope Francis is trying to react against, it seems to me, in terms, of, um, in terms of what the nature of the church is, in terms of the church being a field hospital. There is a tendency, right, especially when things get tough, uh, to circle the wagons, right, to build a wall, as it were, okay, <laughs> to build a wall, to defend ourselves, right? But the church is a broken circle, that is to say, the identity of the church, which is constituted by scripture, sacrament, and living it out, ethics, the identity of the church is to be open to the world. And that's a great idea, it seems to me. The, the very identity of the church is not to be self-enclosed, but to be open. And that is what I think, uh, one of the things that Francis means by the church being a field hospital. Uh, you may have, in this, this beautiful, Tri tripod, you may have uh, recognized the beautiful Greek triad of the good, uh, the, the beautiful, and the true. What, what makes the good life? The good, the beautiful, and the true. The good, ethics. The beautiful, which we neglect to our peril, which is our liturgy, our sacramental life, and, the, and of course, the truth uh, represented by the scriptures. So how shall we connect the Eucharist to life? Here's another uh, African a uh, picture of the, uh, of the uh, Lord's Supper. Second scripture passage, this one, 1 Corinthians 11. We read a portion of this on Holy Thursday evening, but just a portion of it. The same thing is true on the Feast of the Body and Blood of Christ, or also known as Corpus Christi. 
Uh, and we don't read what these next verses say. Verses 17 and following, 1 Corinthians 11. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worst. And he's talking to the Christians in Corinth. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. Think back to that, uh, st that concern of Ignatius of Antioch for unity. And to some extent, I believe it. Inst indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. For when you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Now, presumably, and I think this is our best guess, what he's talking about when he, when he says the Lord's Supper is what we would understand to be the Eucharist. So it's not really the Eucharist. So there's a real problem here. What's the problem? What's the problem? He's going to get to it in a moment. There's a, re there's a profound problem. They don't have the right kind of vessels, the right kind of bread, the right kind of wine, the right kind of ministers. None of this seems to be his concern uh, in this passage. What is his concern? For when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Sounds like a New Yorker there. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. This is why it's not the Lord's Supper, because they are not acting justly. Because they are not acting justly. You cannot participate in the liturgical life of the church as though it were something which, was div which were divorced from the way you live your life. That's what I take him to be saying. They're fracturing the unity of the community by the way they act. And so they are not being the body of Christ. Then he says, and this is what we hear on Holy Thursday, and unfortunately I think we hear it out of its proper context of what Paul is trying to say. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, or the, the equivalent of said the blessing, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. You are sharing in exactly who the Lord is and what the Lord has done for us. If you take that passage out of its context in what that St. Paul is talking uh, in, it seems to me you end up with something, and it, let me be a little provocative here, too religious. I'm against the liturgy being too religious, right? I spent my life teaching and studying and writing about the liturgy, right? But, uh, but I think a big problem, which I think is a wonderful thing, to trust me. Um, I don't think I've wasted my time. But, um, but we make a mistake if we, if we confine it to the church. And I'll be explaining this as I go along. Huh? Whoever eats, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable to the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup for all who eat and drink without discerning the body. Eat and drink judgment against themselves. Now, more contextual, the chapter before, in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the bread that we eat, is it not a participation in the body of the Lord? Paul makes the strictest kind of identification between the body of Christ, which is the Eucharist, and the body of Christ, which is the church. The strictest kind of identification. And that's what he's saying about unworthiness. Many have taken, many sensitive souls uh, in the history of the church have taken this uh, as uh, meaning what we would call mortal sin. This, uh, that, that may be the case, in general, but this is not what Paul is talking about here. So let me give you a bit of traditional sacramental theology here, okay? 
This is right straight out of the Middle Ages. Um, the, the, the medievals, and actually this started with St. Augustine, they had to make some distinctions right, between uh, what the experience of the sacrament was, its reality, and what is it for. Right? So they called the experience of the sacrament, and here the Eucharist is the bread and wine, uh, the sacramentum in Latin, the sacrament. The reality which is produced by the sacrament is called the reality and the sacrament, right? In the terms of the Eucharist, it's the real presence of our Lord, straight out of St. Thomas Aquinas. So. No, I'm not making it up. So. Right. It's, the, it's the real presence of the Lord. But, and this is the point I think we often fail to appreciate, you can't stop at the res at sacramentum. The res, the point, the grace, if you will, of it all is union in and with Christ. And I have bolded that and underlined it uh, with uh, uh, real forethought. Huh? Uh, in and with Christ. That means, right? first of all, don't stop at the resident sacramentum. I am not dismissing the value of adoration, etc., and of uh, what we do in church, and reverence. It's, I'm all for that, but trust me. It's another talk altogether, so all right, trust me. But if we stop there, and Pope Benedict, people who've written about the adoration have made this quite clear, uh, and I'm on the same page as they are. If we do that, we miss the fact that communion cannot be vertical, cannot be with the Lord unless it is in the Lord. You don't get that. You, if you get that, you get it, the ba major point of the presentation. Right? So uh, it, it cannot, if it, if it is not in the Lord, in the body, which is the church, it cannot be with the Lord. It's a lie. Right? It's a lie. So there it is. There's our Lord himself, the presence of the Lord in the sacrament. And I have a picture of a soup kitchen, right? This is, if that's not, if that's, if that's not what comes out of this, I'd, I have no idea what the Eucharist is about. And I think St. Paul's on my side. Okay. Here I picked up, once again, thank you, Google Images. Huh? Uh, I picked this up when I was, this just the other day I found this. Uh, I just found it. It's a wonderful picture huh? of, uh, you call it the wonderful picture of the field hospital, which is the church, of, uh, of what's, what's happening, huh? uh, what kind of sharing is going on as the Lord uh, breaks the bread. Okay. So, once again, that tripod with the open circle, which is the church. Now, I'll, this I'm going to try to relate as much as I can to the Eucharist and social justice, which is basically what I've been talking about, right? the Eucharist and social justice, which is what I think St. Paul was talking about. A great hero of mine is Father Robert Havda. He's a wonderful writer, pioneer in many ways of the liturgical movement in this uh, in this country. Uh, he had a wonderful column in worship, uh, the journal Worship, for many, many years called uh, The Amen Corner, uh, that I had the privilege to, uh, uh, to edit into a book after he died. He never wanted, he thought they were much too uneven, never wanted them to be a book. Uh, so I said, well, after he died, I did it. Uh, so, um, so I hope he forgives me for, for doing what he didn't want, to, want done. In one of the columns, he says, he, he begins it with saying, uh, what do you mean we need more peace liturgies? And he says, people come to me often saying, you know, how come we don't have more social justice liturgies? How come we don't have mass more masses for peace and justice? His answer? Right, and if you picked up what I was just trying to say from St. Paul, you get this, right? Peace liturgies are the only kind we have. And... There's something wrong with the fact that we don't get it, right? That, 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 that's not all too obvious to us. There's something wrong with that fact. Uh, in some ways, that's part of the burden of this presentation as well. Peace liturgies are the only kind uh, we have. So let's look at some of the justice elements that are in the liturgy itself. I'm going to be spelling these out uh, as, as I go along, but, but first of all, penitential rite, the greeting of peace, Communion, 
which I've already talked about somewhat, in and with the Lord, gifts for the poor, and various prayers. Peace and reconciliation, once again, a reflection of my time in, in Africa this, uh, this uh, past July and August. Uh, uh, Matthew chapter 5, quite clear in the, toward the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, it's presumably Jewish sacrifice, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother or sister, and then come and offer your gift. Right? This is the idea of the necessity of reconciliation uh, in the Eucharist. We cannot come together and celebrate as unreconciled people. I think the parallel with uh, what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians is pretty obvious. I hope it's pretty obvious. Now, in terms of what issues from this, there's a beautiful uh, passage from the first real description we get of the Eucharist as we know it from uh, Justin Martyr, uh, a writer, an, ap an apologist, someone who explains Christianity in the mid-second century. Uh, he writes this to the emperor. Uh, and at the end of, if this is at the end of his description of their Sunday gathering for the Eucharist. So I'm not going to go into that. I'll leave that for some other presentation, too. Uh, but this is at the end of it. Each of those who have an abundance and who wish to make an offering gives freely whatever he, presumably she, chooses. And what is collected is given to him who presides, to the leader of the church, which in today's terminology it would be the, the bishop. And he assists the orphans, the widows, the sick, the poor, the prisoners, the foreign visitors, which I think in this context today we should say the immigrants. In a word, he helps all those who are in need. He helps all those. This is the consequence of what they have just celebrated. This is the consequence of what they have just celebrated, this outreach, this giving. So when you go into many of the parish churches uh, in this archdiocese, many, and it's a great thing to see, you know, like out in Lexington where I help, uh, as uh, Jane mentioned, uh, on Sundays, um, you'll find uh, once a month a, a collection of food for food pantries. These people, that, that's a good, visible, tangible sign of what the Eucharist is about. For without that outreach, uh, we do not celebrate what the Lord intends for us to celebrate, uh, in my opinion. Okay, so there it is, giving food for the poor. Uh, again, and this is one of the greatest of, uh, I think, I'm oh, sorry, uh, I missed good old St. Ambrose. Okay. Um, I'll come to John Chrysostom in a, in a, in a moment. Uh, Ambrose, a famous uh, bishop at the end of the fourth century in Milan, uh, says this. You who are rich, do you hear what the Lord God says? Yet you come into church not to give to the poor, but to take instead. counter to the meaning of the, God, of the Eucharist. John Chrysostom, even more powerfully, and this was a favorite quote of John Paul II. He has it in his Dies Domini, uh, his, uh, his uh, document on the, uh, the church, the Lord's Day, uh, and also in his uh, encyclical on the church, and also in the last piece he did, uh, introducing the year of the Eucharist called Stay With Us, Lord, Mane Nobiscum Domine. Here's what, what uh, John Chrysostom says. It's so powerful. I, I think all you pastors who are here, I know there are a number of pastors who are here, should print this in every Sunday bulletin. Do you wish to, Jim, do you think so? I'll, we'll see if you agree with me, Jim Barry. Do you wish to honor the body of Christ? Do not, you wish to honor the body of Christ. What, what Catholic would not say yes, right? Of course I want to. Do not ignore him when he is naked. Do not pay him homage in the temple clad in silk, only then to neglect him outside where he suffers cold and nakedness. He who said, this is my body, is the same one who said, you saw me hungry and you gave me no food. Same one. And whatever you did to the least of my brothers and sisters, you did also to me. What good is it, he says, what good is it if the Eucharistic table is overloaded with golden chalices, 
when he is dying of hunger. What good is it? Right? Every parish bulletin should have this. Contemporary theologian Enrique Dussel, liberation theologian from Latin America, uh, says it in a more uh, succinct way, but I think very powerful way, the Eucharist cannot be celebrated with bread that has been robbed from the backs of the poor. Cannot be celebrated with bread that has been robbed from the backs of the poor. Doesn't take much insight to get that. Huh? Okay. Same point made by Benedict the Sixteenth in his uh, post uh, year of the Eucharist uh, letter on the Eucharist uh, sacramentum, the, the sacrament of charity or of love. The food of truth, the food of truth, nice, nice phrase it seems to me, demands that we denounce inhumane situations in which people starve to death because of injustice and exploitation. This is, I mean, the Eucharist demands that we denounce these situations. And it gives us renewed strength and courage to work tirelessly in the service of the civilization of love. We should be having this imprinted in our minds all the time, right? All the time. This is also in the prayers of the church, the prayers of the church. Uh, the, here's one of the prayers from the, from the fifth Eucharistic prayer, the prayer for various needs and occasions, uh, given the title, Jesus, the Compassion of God. Open our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters. This we can pray. And we often don't listen to what's being prayed. Open our eyes to the needs of our brothers and sisters. Inspire in us words and actions to comfort those who labor and are burdened. It goes on. Make us serve them truly after the example of Christ and his command. And may your church stand as a living witness to truth and freedom, to peace and justice, that all people may be raised up to a new hope. Again, the same prayer five, but in the third version, grant that all the faithful of the church looking into the signs of the times by the light of faith may constantly devote themselves to the service of the gospel. Keep us, and here you can see an echo of Vatican II, especially its last great document, the Constitution on the Church in the Modern World. Keep us attentive to the needs of all, that sharing their grief and pain, their joy and their hope, that's the, the title of that document, we may faithfully bring them the good news of salvation and go forward with them along accompaniment, along the way uh, of your kingdom. Uh, let me be a little ecumenical here for a moment and turn to a document which I think is an is a extremely good document some 34 years after it was issued. Uh, this is a convergence document of the World Council of Churches, Faith and Water Commission, uh, entitled Baptism, Eucharist, and Ministry. It's the Eucharist portion of the document. And all of the Christian churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, Cardinal Dulles, for example, Father Dulles at that point, uh, was one of the uh, one of the participants in in putting this together. The Catholic Church, the Orthodox churches, the Anglicans, the Pro various Protestant churches. Um, here in their document, they have they have five meanings that they talk about in terms of the Eucharist, and I'll only stress the two that are at the point of my my presentation. First is thanksgiving to the Father. The second is uh, remembrance or memorial of the Son. The third is petition for the Holy Spirit um, or invocation of the Holy Spirit. Now the, the fourth, however, is communion of the faithful. And so here, once again, think back to that res. What's the point of the Eucharist? The Eucharist embraces all aspects of life. It is a representative act of thanksgiving and offering on behalf of the whole world. The Eucharistic celebration demands, go back to that, that thought of Benedict, demands reconciliation and sharing among all those regarded as brothers and sisters in the one family of God, not restricting to Christians, huh? and is a constant challenge in the search for appropriate relationships in social, economic, and political life. Demands this reconciliation and sharing. 
as if you don't, if you don't get the point, they go on. All kinds of injustice, racism, separation, and lack of freedom are radically challenged when we share in the body and blood of Christ. All sorts are radically challenged. Through the Eucharist, the all-renewing grace of God penetrates and restores human personality and dignity. Last part of this, a quote from Baptism Eucharist Ministry, as participates, participants in the Eucharist, therefore, we prove inconsistent if we are not actively participating in this ongoing restoration of the world's situation and the human condition. It's not enough to go to church on Sunday. It's a good thing, but it's not enough. Let me, let me spell this out with my own understanding of what happens in the Eucharist. I'll go back to those four verbs, take, bless, break, give. Now, those verbs that, that uh, describe what the Lord did at the Last Supper, the multiplication, the Emmaus story, those four verbs, it seemed to me, uh, characterize not only what we celebrate, but the one whom we celebrate, so what we celebrate, right? taking, the presentation of the gifts, blessing, put down there the Jewish word for this barakah, and I don't have time uh, to go into, into the notion of barakah uh, at any great length, but the barakah means blessing. What it means is it's the prayers that we use, for example, at the presentation of the gifts. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Blessed are you. Lord, you are blessed. You are holy because you have given us all of these things. So that's the idea of Jewish idea of blessing at the time of Jesus, is to, to acknowledge God primarily for who God is and what God has done for us. That makes everything usable to us only if we acknowledge God as its source. The opposite we would call sin, right? not to acknowledge God uh, as the source of every good thing, the idea behind it is also that all creation is good, right? Is good, but it's only usable for you and me when we acknowledge God uh, as its giver. This is the Eucharistic prayer. Breaking, Jesus broken and poured out, the fraction right. And giving, Jesus' own self shared, the communion right, which I have suggested a number of times now is both vertical and horizontal. By the way, that's why the Roman Rite, we don't observe this very often in the US, we try to observe it at the School of Theology and Ministry at our Thursday liturgies and our weekday liturgies. The Roman Rite asks that everyone remain standing until everyone has received Holy Communion. That's in the Roman Rite, the, the Roman Missal, Catholic liturgy. That every, why? to give that sense of solidarity, that we are one with one another. Then it says people can sit down or kneel down and pray individually, of course, devotion, thanksgiving to the Lord for this, this uh, beautiful gift of his own self to us uh, that's perfectly uh, appropriate. But it says first that everybody should remain standing until this. Uh, so. Take, bless, break, give. It seems to me that this is exactly who the Lord is. huh? that the Lord is the one who, having accepted his life from the one he calls Abba, Father, blesses God completely with his life. We only approximate this, right? We are not sinless as he is. Allows himself to be broken so that he can be poured out, given for others, shared for others. This is the opp opposite of the dog-eat-dog -dog world or this nice picture here of uh, nice, <laughs> Uh, Jurassic Park kind of, uh, okay, so uh, the kind of world where, which is a feeding frenzy, right? The Eucharist is the opposite of a feeding frenzy. It's about sharing, breaking open and sharing, right? So it's important not to look at life as, uh, as if it were, and I realize I'm saying this in the wake of uh, national elections, uh, a zero-sum game, right? In which everybody, if you get a bigger slice of the pie, I do not get uh, as big a slice of the pie. That is not Christian life, right? Christian life is the more love you give, the more love you have. The more you share, the more you have. Not a zero-sum game. The last meaning of the Baptism Eucharist ministry document is called the meal of the kingdom. 
many of you will find this familiar, this picture familiar, right? It's from uh, Babette's Feast, that beautiful uh, short story and uh, made into a film, a short story by Isaac Dinesen. Uh, and had we whirled enough in time, we'd, we'd talk a lot about the movie, go, go to rent it on Netflix or something. And uh, uh, it's well worth it if you've never uh, seen it. It's a very powerful uh, movie about sh with the effect of food and drink on sharing and making human beings human beings. Right? Here's another picture of the meal of the kingdom. Uh, it's the, the meal of Abraham and the three guests, which is also uh, known as the icon of the Trinity and in the Eastern churches. Uh, the meal of the kingdom. What's the point of the meal of the kingdom? Here's an invitation to Holy Communion. The uh, brothers of uh, the uh, Society of St. John the Evangelist across the, uh, the river, uh, an Anglican monastic order, Cambridge, uh, use this regularly as their invitation to communion, which I think is quite beautiful. Behold your mystery, says the priest. May we become what we receive. Straight out of St. Augustine of Hippo, actually. But may we become what we receive. That's the point, right? Becoming what we receive. That kind of a Eucharistic people. They say in the document, I'll give you a couple of quotes from the document. The Eucharist opens up the vision of the divine rule which has been promised as the final renewal of creation and is a foretaste of it. Sometimes people call the Eucharist the antipasto of the kingdom. I like that, because I like antipasto. Right? Although I probably shouldn't talk too much about food at this hour of the evening. Okay. Signs of this renewal are present in the world wherever the grace of God is manifest and human beings, signs of this, right, of the kingdom, wherever human beings work for justice, love, and peace. The Eucharist is the feast at which the church gives thanks to God for these signs and joyfully celebrates and anticipates the coming of the kingdom in Christ. So sometimes people call the Eucharist kingdom rehearsal, right? Rehearsal for the kingdom, kingdom practice. Reconciled in the Eucharist, the members of the body of Christ are called to be servants of reconciliation among men and women and witnesses of the joy of the resurrection. As Jesus went out to publicans and sinners and had table fellowship with them during his earthly ministry, so Christians are called in the Eucharist to be in solidarity with the outcast and to become the signs of the love of Christ who lived and sacrificed himself for all and now gives himself uh, in the Eucharist. I'm going to just skip some of it because of... Uh, so that we'll have a little more time for, uh, for conversation and for questions. I'm going to skip some of the next, uh, uh, this next slide to this one. As it is entirely the gift of God, the Eucharist brings into the present age, sometimes we call this realized eschatology, right? what the kingdom is now. By the way, the kingdom can be a, a funny word. Sounds like crowns, royalty, ermine, whatever, right? Orbs and scepters. Kingdom really means what God wants the world to look like. Right? That's what kingdom really means. Into the present age, a new reality which transforms Christians into the image of Christ and therefore makes them his effective witnesses. So as one of my friends loved, used to love to say, uh, the Eucharist is as much about the transformation of you and me as it is about the transformation of bread and wine. I would say it is only about the transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ insofar as it leads to the transformation of you and me into the body and blood of Christ. Uh, I'll skip some of the rest of the, these. Once again, to my Episcopal friends, of many, and I'm very fond of that tradition, uh, in one of their prayers, I think, says, says it quite beautifully. Deliver us, they say, in the Eucharistic prayer C, their third prayer in the Book of Common Prayer. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only. We do come for solace, right? For comfort, for, for, to receive God's compassion, mercy, forgiveness. We do, of course. But for, for solace only and not for strength. For pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, also, a very important phrase in our Eucharistic prayer three, may we become one body, one spirit in Christ. 
that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Now, it seems to me in, in talking about the Eucharist as this medicine uh, in this field hospital, which is the church, uh, uh, the Eucharist as this great engine of social justice, which I've been trying to, to uh, talk about in this uh, past hour, I would be remiss if I did not say something about the Eucharist and ecology, and especially in terms of, the, uh, of, uh, of one of the major initiatives of uh, Pope Francis and the, the clear connections, it seems to me, that we need to make between this physical, material food and drink, uh, which we hold so precious, and the food and drink which uh, humankind needs so desperately and uh, which uh, only a decent environment will be able to provide. So the Eucharist and ecology. Would that we use nice bread like that, but uh, yeah. that's not up to me. And it's uh, the, well, there are many things that are well beyond my control. So you just have to, you just have to let it go. Okay. Uh, Pope Francis in Laudato Si, his encyclical, uh, encyclical on the care for our planet. It is in the Eucharist that all that has been created finds its greatest exaltation. I like that. Grace, which tends to manifest itself tangibly, right? Not in some like way beyond the clouds, but tangibly in our physical lives, found unexpressible expression when God himself became man, human, and gave himself as food for his creatures. There's that connection made constantly throughout the Christian tradition between the incarnation of the Lord and the Eucharist. Right? This is sometimes called the marvelous exchange of the God and humanity in both the incarnation and in the Eucharist. The Lord, Pope Francis continues, in the culmination of the mystery of the incarnation, chose to reach our intimate depths through a fragment of matter. He comes not from above, but from within. He comes that we might find him in this world of ours, in this world of ours. I can make a plug for my own religious order. How could I not make a plug for my own religious order? Uh, the Jesuits, all right, this, is, this is Pope Francis at his best with Ignatian or Jesuit spirituality, seeing God in all things. There's another, real grapes, huh? real wheat. Not to be outdone, Benedict XVI, in his homily for the Mass of Corpus Christi, the Eucharist joins heaven and earth. It people want to make too much of a distinction between Benedict and Francis. I don't think see how much continuity there is, too. The Eucharist joins heaven and earth. It embraces and penetrates all creation. The world, which came forth from God's hands, returns to him in blessed and undivided adoration. The world returns to God. I think that's the point of it all. In the bread of the Eucharist, creation is project creation is projected towards divinization, towards the holy wedding feast, towards unification with the Creator Himself. And then the bottom line of, of what he's trying to say. Thus, he says, Pope Benedict, the Eucharist is also a source of light and motivation for our concerns, for the environment, directing us to be the stewards of all creation. So pope Francis was not the first person to be concerned, the first pope, modern pope, to be concerned with uh, the importance of, of ecology and with making that connection huh, between the Eucharist and care for the earth that God has given to us, huh, our concerns for the environment. Let me uh, conclude all of this uh, with a prayer that is uh, found. I think it's, it's an excellent prayer that says something about our mission uh, from the Eucharist, how the, how the mission, the Eucharist sends us forth. You know that one of the names of the Eucharist, common names for the Eucharist is the Mass, which is a word that comes from the Latin word missa, which means sent, uh, which uh, let me translate very, very loosely for you, go, this is what's said at the end of Mass. Right? Go, get out of here, do what you've just been celebrating. Right? Do and become what you have just been celebrating. Go, get out of here, go. The point of it all, right? we call it the Mass, right? Get out of here and do it, do it, put it into action. I think it's expressed beautifully in the post-communion prayer, which is said by everyone. We have 
prayers that are said by the priest in the Catholic rite, uh, but in the Episcopal Church. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son, horizontal communion, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. I, that's, I typed this out myself, and you see what a bad typist I am. Okay, because I don't think that was a sentence. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do. Send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful uh, witnesses of Christ our Lord. So once again, my bad typing. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit be honor and glory now and forever. And it seems to me this is what it means to call the Eucharist the medicine of immortality. Thank you for your attention. Now, now, as has been the practice, I have a little bibliography there for you, but um, uh, I'll, we can put it up later. As, as has been the practice, we ask you to turn to one another and for a couple of minutes, you know, in a group of two, three, four, whatever you like, uh, to talk about uh, what you've just heard. And here are a couple of questions. Uh, so we'll take five minutes to do this. A couple of questions and then, then use the rest of our time, which should give us plenty of time, uh, to, uh, to have conversation, hear your comments, questions, etc. cetera. Uh, so how can the celebration of the Eucharist in our community, or communities you celebrate in, better model what we call the kingdom table, right? the meal of the kingdom? How can we help others make that connection between the Eucharist and social justice that I've been trying to, uh, to uh, hammer away at for this uh, last hour, and the connection with the value and importance of the environment. So there are just some of the questions uh, that I've tried to just to, to stimulate your conversation. I'll give you five minutes, all right, and I'll time you. Uh, so uh, take five minutes and talk to one another. Uh, now it's your turn. I think we're gonna have some of the, we have some uh, students here, assistants with, with a uh, microphone. Uh, so please, uh, let let uh, it's right here, uh, right in the front rows here. Thank you. I have a question about the Emma's story. We frequently f find in the stories like that, that Jesus hides his identity and is only recognized later. Could you please say something about that? Okay. Uh, yeah, I th what, what's interesting, isn't it, in the, in the three stories that, that are post-resurrection stories, what, what happens? Uh, in the breakfast uh, cook story, it's, it's him cooking breakfast, right? Feeding them that it's the Lord, right? Says John to Peter. In the encounter in the garden with Mary Magdalene, it's, the, it's his, his pronunciation of her name, right? That, that does it, right? that, that makes the ice break. It's, in the Emmaus story, it's the sacramental act that does it. And, uh, and uh, I, Chauvet has a beautiful, actually, in his in the lar longer book, has a beautiful uh, and extended uh, treatment of this passage. And one of the things he says is that uh, now we realize that we, to, to have him present uh, is also to have him absent, but to have him present is to have him present in the sacrament because we don't have him in his physical body in the same way, right, in the same way. We have him in his real sacramental body, but we don't have him, just like the Mary story, don't hold on to me, right? Um, so it seems to me it's got to be some action, and that's, so it's, and I think that's part of the sacramental thing in Catholicism, right? That is that the word is not sufficient for, to give the whole story, is not sufficient to give the whole story. 
Um, which, which is not to say that the word is not absolutely necessary either. I'm not, I wouldn't go there. That's not, that's not true. The tripod, the tripod would fall down, right? Would go, come crashing down uh, if that were the case. Um, but so you need the, the, the scripture. Without the scripture, you don't have it. And you also need it being translated into action. Ethic, well, using the term loosely, ethics. I think another, some over here, The microphone is coming. Thank you. Thank you for the very beautiful and uplifting reflection on the Eucharist. Just in response to the previous question, I'm not sure Jesus was hiding his identity. Rather, I think that the disciples, like us, failed to recognize Jesus, as we do, hmm. when Jesus is present in situations where we hadn't expected it. So I think it's really, I think it's an extension of our reality and our humanity that fails to grasp the presence of Jesus. Being, being a good Catholic, I'd love to say both and. But <laughs> <laughs> being a good Jesuit, you mean. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Touche, fair enough. <laughs> I could tell. <laughs> Other questions or comments, please. Oh, over here, right over here. Um, in in relating the uh, the experience of the Eucharist uh, to the real world, um, how can we avoid mistranslating um, what we have received? Um, and, and I guess my question is kind of like steeped in the current uh, environment of politics, how can we best serve as Catholics um, when you know, we see different people with different opinions on how to best uh, alleviate suffering and pain? No, that's that's, that's uh, very good, and that's a very fair question. Um, it seems to me that we, we cannot expect the sacraments or the Eucharist to give us blueprints for social programs not gonna tell us what to do exactly about poverty, right? Or about uh, bringing clean water to people who do not have it, or electric power, et cetera. Once again, I was deeply affected by my experience in South Africa in uh, July and August, where I saw so many places that you'd passed, more visible than it is to us, huh? uh, these places that people have no water, no electricity, and uh, so it's very in your face, huh? So, the, the necessity to do that comes out of the character formation or the virtue formation that I would say is characteristic of the Eucharist. The necessity to be united, the necessity to share, those kinds of things. Now, honest people right, can have differing ways of trying to address those very serious questions, right? And I would say that the Eucharist is not exactly going to help us to, to find those kinds of solutions. But the good news is that it is going to make us conscious of, as Pope Benedict put it, the demand huh, to respond to those questions. So that no matter who we are, right, whether we take one approach to social reality or another, which is just, you know, honest people can differ about these things. Uh, no matter who we are, we have to, one thing is absolutely necessary, and that is that it is necessary for us to address them. Otherwise, we're making a lot, my point, we're making a lie out of the Eucharist. I hope that came through clear, loud and clear. <laughs> if it didn't, that was my fault. Other comments or observations or questions? Having talked about food for so long, I fear that, uh, <laughs> that I've uh, let you uh, grow in your appetite. So perhaps we can, uh, we can bring our, our uh, time to a close. And uh, I think Melinda wants to uh, 